Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Morn. I'm the Senior Vice President of Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Conducive Technologies, welcoming you to today's webinar. It's right now just the top of the hour, and so we can uh, get uh, started here. We'll just kind of set the table and the fr and the framework for the conversation here while we're waiting for the rest of the participants to dial in for today's webinar. I believe that we're expecting around 250, and it looks like we have 194 dialed in so far. And um, and sure, here over the next two or three minutes, we'll get everybody else to join. Um, with me over to my right, coming from sunny Southern California, is uh, Gary Kwan, who is the SVP of Technology Strategy over here. We affectionately refer to him as GQ. It's GQ, I'm glad that you could uh, join me today for today's webinar. Thank you, Brian, and GQ, not because my lifestyle, just easy initials, and I'm the tech guy here. I'm going to keep Brian honest <laughs> here. <my> stuff. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll check in on the wife with that one. <laughs> um, now, uh, you, I know that a number of you had signed in today. This, we're speaking to all virtualized organizations. Uh, we're talking about the two silent killers of VM performance that GQ, in our experience, you steal up to 50% of the I.O. bandwidth from VM to storage. And actually, 50% is on the low end. We've seen it upward towards 300% in many cases. So we're speaking of something that not a lot of administrators typically know about. You know, GQ, what they typically do is what they've always done is, is simply just take the brute force approach and throw more hardware at the problem and, and continue to over-provision for performance. But that doesn't fix the problem. That's more of a mask for what the problem really is. It's a, you're right. It's just a Band-Aid. So, you know, what you really want to do is get to the cause and fix that. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Uh, with that said, GQ, why don't you go ahead and advance us to uh, the next slide. Looks like we have uh, nearly everybody that we expected to be on today's webinar ready to start with us. Um, and before we get into the actual content itself, um, you may wonder, hey, you know, who's talking and who are we listening to and, and why do we have any authority in this space to be speaking? Well, you know, here's the obligatory slide that tells you that. Um, we've been in business for 34 years. So as a software company, uh, that's almost since forever. In fact, it makes us the 12th oldest software company in the world. And GQ, you are employee number... Number uh, two here. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been a while. So GQ is uh, one of the chief architects here at the company. In fact, he's built in even some of the hooks uh, into the Windows Microsoft operating system itself for um, its original first lightweight uh, defrag utility that came with the Windows operating system. In fact, um, if you don't know about Conducive or haven't heard of Conducive or Velocity IO Reduction Software, you may know our heritage, formerly DiskKeeper, known for years and years as the number one defrag utility for Windows Systems GQ. That's right. We work closely with Microsoft and provided Microsoft with a lot of the hooks that allow online defragmentation. Well, uh, if we were to rewind four years ago, we rebranded as a company to Conducive Technologies, and the reason that that happened had to do with how we pivoted with our intellectual property, where our bread and butter um, really isn't, has, even though we have solutions, GQ, for, for defragmentation, our bread and butter is optimizing I.O. streams and virtualized environments. That has absolutely nothing to do with defragmentation. Exactly, and what we're looking at mainly is improving the performance of the applications. So for that reason, we've been named by Gartner uh, to their cool vendor list, which is a very weird thing for Gartner to do uh, with a 34-year-old software company, and it's because of how we're leading in the I.O. performance space from a software perspective. And we've had other accolades like Tech Target, Storage Software Product of the Year. So, um, And not only do we optimize I.O. streams for fast performance, GQ, we also call ourselves a world leader in caching technology. A lot of people may not know us for that. We believe that we've sold more caching licenses than any other player. How many OEM partners do we have in the PC space? You know what? Nine of the top OEM partners use our technology. They use it under their own name, so that's why you don't know about us. But they come to us. And not only the top uh, nine OEMs, we have vendors such as uh, Western Digital and SanDisk and Samsung using our technology. 
So that says something, Brian. Okay. Yeah, it does. So we have a close relationship with Microsoft and VMware. In fact, over the years, we sold 50 million licenses and, and have a 90% footprint in the Fortune 500. Okay. All right. We got that slide out of the way. <laughs> so anyhow, that just gives you some context of who you're uh, listening to here today and uh, understand the uh, leadership that, that uh, we come from in this space to really tell you about what you see on the screen in front of you, which is uh, the two silent killers of VM performance. So today we're talking about the two big I.O. inefficiencies that's akin to pouring molasses on, on your systems. Now the reason that you may not have heard about either of these performance penalties is because there is no hardware solution for it other than when we'll just buy more, more hardware because the hardware can only process I.O., it can't optimize I.O. So if the I.O. characteristics of a workload are much smaller, more fractured, or more random than it needs to be, well, hardware can do nothing about that except just work much harder than necessary and longer than necessary uh, to process any given unit of data. So for GQ, for our customers, usually for them, that's finding out that their systems are processing workloads about 50% slower than they should. In fact, you even see many cases where it's even worse than that. Exactly. 50%, as I said before, is a low end. We've, we've seen 300%, and even more than that, Brian, even in the thousands in some cases. So uh, on this slide, um, I'm going to tell you what the problem is, and then on, on the next slide we'll tell you exactly how big that problem is and how much it's affecting your system, so you know we're not just talking features and theory here. But uh, you may be already aware of the I.O. blender effect on the right uh, that mixes and randomizes the I.O. streams from disparate VMs uh, at the hypervisor layer before sending out to storage a very random pattern. Um, it's known as the I.O. blender effect, and, and that really random pattern um, is much harder for storage to process than sequential I.O. Uh, that's true for both flash and spindles. Um, especially writes when it comes to flash. So, but before we look at that problem on the right on the hypervisor, you actually have to start first on the left and look at a very different problem, a little higher in the stack than the hypervisor, where the first problem is actually begins on a Windows VM on the left, where you find the first big I.O. inefficiency in a virtual environment. We call it the Windows I.O. tax. And what it does is it generates increasingly smaller, more fractured I.O. over time, which essentially creates an IOPS inflation of your, of your applications, and it further amplifies the problem of randomization at the hypervisor from the I.O. blender effect on the right, because now you have even more noise and more randomization from all the VMs going down to the host. Now, GQ, what's interesting about this is that this Windows problem isn't a problem on day one. And you're right, Brian. On day one of a fresh, clean Windows NTFS installation, you know, the relationship between the I.O. and data is very healthy and looks like the I.O. on the right where all 32K of a single I.O. is contained. I'm oh, sorry, 32K data is contained in a single I.O because it sits in a single address at the logical disk layer. It's a nice, clean, contiguous write, and subsequently, it's going to be a contiguous read. But as time goes on in a Windows environment, the relationship between I.O. and data begins to break down. And increasingly smaller and smaller chunks, like what you see on the far left. Now, I'm not talking about the physical layer where data lives. In a SANA connected environment, Windows is extracted from the physical layer. So I'm talking about the logical disk that Windows controls. And Brian, maybe you can expand a little more on this. Well, I mean, GQ, basically what it comes down to, it, and, and tell me, uh, maybe to help our audience understand this a, a little better, this is because Windows is never looking for the best allocation to write a file at the logical disk layer. It's only looking for the next available allocation, whether it's the right size or not. So what you're saying is that the reason it's not a problem on day one is because on day one, the next available allocation is almost always the right size allocation. But as time goes on and files are written and erased and rewritten and extended, there's a lot of free space fragmentation. So the next available allocation is rarely ever the right size. 
So when Windows goes to write uh, a file, it will write part of the file, fill the allocation, split the file, find the next available address, fill it, split again, repeat and repeat with continued fractured files in I.O. until the file is fully written. Now that's right, Brian. And you know what this means is that that 32K data that should be written and read as a single I.O., well, it gets break, broken down into four chunks or maybe eight chunks living at different addresses in the logical disk. And every piece of the file requires its own dedicated I.O. operation to process it. So not only does this create an I.O. overhead issue for the compute layer, but more importantly, it's robbing your throughput to storage and making you more IOPS dependent, more random IOPS dependent than you need to be. So it's going to take more, much more longer to process a gigabyte, a gigabyte of data because it's going to require many more IOPS. And Brian, how big a problem does this cause? Well, this is what makes it such a big issue in a virtualized environment. You, know, you might think of this being bad enough in a physical server environment where it's just you know, uh, a, a relation between one physical server and the connected storage, storage device. But this becomes an enormous problem in a virtual environment. Well, because of that thing that you see on the right called the I.O. blender effect, all the I.O. traffic from all your VMs that have this inefficiency, they all get mixed and randomized at the point of the hypervisor. So it's bad enough if a Windows VM has its own problem sending down a bunch of small fractured I.O., but even worse, when it's happening across all your VMs and they all hit the hypervisor, where everything is then mixed and randomized. So now you have a lot of noise happening at the hypervisor and an I.O. profile that couldn't be harder for the storage subsystem to process because the I.O. characteristics aren't just small and fractured. Instead, you're dealing with small fractured random I.O., which is the perfect trifecta for bad performance. And your hardware can do nothing about this uh, except simply process it. So GQ, go to the next slide there. You know, we spent quite a bit of time here, but I think our audience might be going, okay, you know, what you're saying makes sense in features and theory, but what does this actually mean? Well, this slide gives you that. Uh, these are the unfiltered results from the last 3,500 VMs that evaluated our velocity IO reduction software solution on their production workloads at over 100 different sites. Now, in a minute, we will show you how our software solves these performance penalties from I.O. that is much smaller, more fractured, more random than it needs to be. But the first thing you need to see is, well, how big is this problem actually, and how much is it affecting your systems? So the data that you see in front of you on this slide has been independently validated by the storage analyst group, ESG. And in fact, right now they're uh, finalizing the report, and we're going to publish it in one week or, or two weeks. So you can see on the screen in front of you how big of a problem is this? Well, on over half of all systems that evaluated velocity to solve these problems on their virtual servers, over half the system saw a 50% decrease in read I.O. from VM to storage. Now that's, that's pretty significant. But we're not just talking read I.O. here, we're also talking write I.O. Because 27% of all systems see a 33% reduction in write I.O. to storage. In fact, 14% of systems have such high levels of I.O. inefficiency, GQ, that you were talking about, that 14% of systems get a 50% decrease in write I.O. And that's on top of the decrease that they're seeing in, in read I.O. So if you go to the next slide, you say, well, you know, how does I.O. reduction at the virtual server layer, how does it relate to performance in my environment uh, when it comes to throughput, response time, IOPS? Well, yeah, we have all that data for you here. 43% of all systems that tested velocity saw a 50% increase in the amount of data that they could process in the same amount of time. So that's a big jump in throughput, whether it, and that was regardless of being on flash or spindles. Uh, as far as I.O. response time, this one is, will probably really catch your attention. Just 3 gig of available DRAM delivers, on average, 40% latency reduction on, on all I.O. across all systems when they're using our, our software. In fact, what's interesting is that 25% of all systems actually get a 50% increase in IOPS. Now, you might think that IOPS would go down with our solution 
because we're eliminating all that small, tiny I.O. that's chewing up your system performance with death by a thousand cuts. But since we're helping to sequentialize I.O. streams and serve some of that I.O. out of DRAM, IOPS actually, actually goes up. So, did you keep, if you take us to, to the next slide, maybe now that we, you have your attention, um, let me first set the table with our value proposition to just to help you conceptually understand you know, what we do, and then I'm going to pass the torch to GQ to dig under the hood to show you how we solve some of those inefficiencies so you can see how you can solve them in your own environment. So what we're talking about today is, is Velocity I.O. reduction software, and it's a 100% software approach to solving the toughest application performance challenges in your virtual environment on your existing hardware. There's no need for any additional hardware. It runs transparently on your virtual servers with near zero overhead to compute resource to solve these big I.O. inefficiencies that's stealing your I.O. bandwidth from VM to storage. So, Velocity provides two key benefits that you're going to care about the most. Number one, it increases, it increases throughput on existing systems um, from, from VM to storage, whether it's flash or spindles. And the second thing it does is it reduces I.O. response time. So, to do this, Velocity solves those two big I.O. inefficiencies that we just talked about with two different uh, patented engines. The first engine increases I.O. density and it sequentializes your I.O. traffic. So what it does is we help Windows write files in a more contiguous fashion from the VM layer. So this means you get a lot more throughput because it's dealing with, instead of dealing with a, a lot of small fractured random I.O. that brings system performance to its knees, Velocity optimizes that I.O. profile where I.O. originates to be more storage friendly and ultimately require less I.O. to process the exact same amount of given data. Now, the second patented engine in Velocity is very different from the first. It's a DRAM read caching engine that uses the available server DRAM you already have. So if you think of your RAM as a precious resource and you're concerned about allocating memory for cache, you don't have to worry about that because you don't have to allocate anything for cache. It just dynamically uses what's available. And it throttles according to the need of the application, so there's never an issue of resource contention or memory starvation. So, in fact, just three gig of available DRAM, which you might not think is a lot of capacity, has such a big impact with our behavioral analytics engine that we deliver, on average, a 40% reduction in response time across all I.O. So, by having one engine that reduces the number of write I.O. from VM to storage and another engine that reduces the number of read I.O., our customers see anywhere from 50 to 300 percent faster application performance on their heaviest workloads without having to add any additional hardware. So, GQ, I'm going to hand this over to you uh, in just a minute. But before I do that, let's just show them kind of the next slide to, to give them a visual of what's happening in their environment without Velocity and what happens in their environment with Velocity optimizing their I.O. profile. And, and once we give them this visual, you can dig in just a little deeper on both engines. Right. So I, I think that you all remember that commercial, this is your brain and this is your brain on drugs. Well, here's the virtualization version of that. This is your I.O. without velocity on the left, and this is your I.O. with velocity on the right. So you see on the left, the I.O. characteristics of your workloads are a lot smaller, more fractured, more random, just like we talked about. Far more I.O. than necessary is required to process a gig of data. The underlying storage subsystem is overwhelmed because it has to work much harder than necessary and longer than necessary to process any given unit of data. And then on the right is what happens after you use Velocity. Both patented engines are at work to re reduce write I.O. and read I.O. from VM to storage and write files in a more sequential manner. So GQ, maybe you can help our audience understand how exactly does Velocity do this? I said the first engine sequentializes I.O. traffic and helps Windows write files in a more contiguous way. How does it do this? Be glad to join in here, Brian. And, and first is our patented technology to optimize write. You know, Velocity provides intelligence to Windows about file sizes. And what this does is it helps Windows choose the best allocation at the logical disk layer 
instead of just the next available allocation. Now, what this does is it stops I.O. fracturing, increases I.O. density, improves the sequential nature of traffic, and ultimately reduces the amount of I.O. required to process a gigabyte of data. Since the Windows is now processing all writes and subsequential reads in a more contiguous fashion. And if you ever look at benchmarks on storage, you'll always see that sequential I.O. always outperforms random I.O. So instead of needing 16,000 I.O. to process a gigabyte data, you may only need 10,000 I.O. or 8,000 I.O. or even less, depending on how bad your system is taxed. Now, Brian, you have a good analogy on this. Yeah, and I think that's something just to kind of help conceptually understand. It's, it's if you're trying to move a gallon of water or <laughs> across the room, you can do it one of two ways. You can do it with 300 Dixie cups or you can do it with a gallon jug. And that's basically what Velocity is doing. It's reading and then writing more data with every I.O. operation to deliver more throughput because a gig of data does not need as many I.O. as your application currently requires as soon as we increase I.O. density, which ultimately reduces the noise and randomization that occurs at the hypervisor layer. Now, GQ Riley is, is asking here, is this installed on the guest OS? Uh, Riley, it is installed on the client, on the virtual machines themselves. And we're going to tell you why that's important in a couple of slides here. So, GQ, I mentioned just previously about our, our second engine, which is very different from the first. It optimizes reads with our uh, server side DRAM read caching engine. And, you know, people might be a little hesitant to understand how can we reduce response time so significantly with just a limited amount of DRAM? Well, that's because of our patented technology and telememory. And it's because we're able to remove even more I.O. from the I.O. Blender. The Velocity server-side DRAM caching engine takes advantage, as mentioned, of the available DRAM you already have to cache reads. And if we can cache reads, we're satisfying that I.O. right there where it's getting created. Again, with even less I.O. going to storage, that's even less randomization and noise at the hypervisor. And not to mention, you'll even got, get much faster response times. Now, per the early results slide that Brian showed, over half the systems that evaluate velocity, they saw a 50% reduction in read I.O. And with just three gigabytes of available memory, it reduced response time by 40% on average across all systems. Now, we mentioned three gigabytes, but it only uses what memory you have available. So it's very dynamic. You don't have to add memory. You will just use what's available. Yeah, so, and James just asked this question, right, just as you were saying that as it came in. He said, do you need more cash on the server to use this software? No. We'll just, as I indicate, we'll just use what's available there. Now, if you... And we'll mention this later. Some people see such great gains with three gigabytes, they want to add just or allocate a little more memory on there to even get better benefits. Right? Now, some people may not think of three gigabytes of available memory having much impact, but it's a huge impact. First, it's because DRAM is so much faster than any other form of flash, and people forget how much faster. And it sits closer to the processor than anything else. And second, due to our behavior analytics engine that monitors what the application is doing, we sit right there at the VM layer. We have a very close relationship with the application, so we know exactly what to cache and when. And because of that, we can make the most of the limited amount of capacity. And that's really where our intelligence comes in. We really know what and when to cache data. So we're going to be very efficient and very effective than any other caching solution out there. Now, this is what allows us to do the very advanced form of caching. And because you, we sit next to the application, or we're very application aware, those other forms of caching that sit down below are not. Because they sit so much further down the stack after the I.O. streams have already been mixed and randomized, they're just guessing. 
And as a result, they have a lot of cash churn, and they also need a, a lot more capacity to be effective. In fact, you know, GQ, you, most people start with velocity only by using their available DRAM that they already have. And then once they see how significantly their read I.O. is served and how significantly response time is reduced, um, that's usually when the light goes on and they realize if they need more performance, what they need to do before anything else is just add more DRAM uh, server side and allocate that to velocity as tier zero for their caching strategy. Exactly, and some of them, they don't have to add any more memory. They just have to allocate unused memory that they're not uh, getting anything from right now. And, in fact, with the price evolution of DRAM, its speed and proximity to the processor, it just makes more sense to add more DRAM first and give that to velocity before doing anything else. So, essentially, the takeaway is that with both of these engines working together at the VM layer to reduce I.O. to storage, this is what enables our customers to see anywhere from 50 to 300 percent more performance on, on existing systems. Now, a Major had a question here at GQ. He said, do different application types have different benefit to your optimization? How about database servers? You know, I'm glad he asked that. Database servers is a sweet spot for us, Brian, because they're very I.O. intensive. And things that are I.O. intensive, that's where we really perform best at. Yeah, in fact, I would have to say that probably the the 75% use case of people who try Velocity, I mean, one, we found out that most customers, before they deploy, deploy site-wide on everything, they usually start with their most I.O. intensive systems, which is where we do benefit them the most. 75% of the time, that seems to be something running on top of SQL or Oracle. Exactly, and those databases are our sweet spot, Brian. Now, uh, Thomas had a question here. He said, since this is installed on the guest OS, is a license by each license by each Windows guest, um, or, or is the licensing model based on something else? Uh, Thomas, we're actually licensed by host, so you can have any number of VMs running on that host and, and deploy Velocity to. Uh, it's, it's a host-based pricing model. So the GQ, this slide, I know we had questions about this earlier. This may answer some of the questions that others have about our technology and framing it. This, tech, this slide just simply shows where our technology sits. Exactly. I think it's one of the most important slides, Brian, at least technically, because it shows we're not a virtual appliance, we're not an agent, and we're not a resource hog. We're a very thin file system driver that runs with near zero overhead, and we're installed right into the Windows operating system on a virtual machine, and that's because that's where the I.O. originates, so we're going to provide the best benefits. And since the I.O. optimization is taking place at the OS level on the VM, not only does it mean everything downstream gets benefit, it also means that we're agnostic to the hypervisor vendors and the storage vendors who sit below us. You know, if they're compatible with Windows, they're compatible with us. Velocity does not change anything related to the I.O. because we never touch the I.O. It's now just an optimized Windows I.O. So that's why you see this. We'll work with any uh, compatible, Windows compatible storage and any Windows compatible hypervisor. So Robin just asked, will this work on VMware? And I think you just answered that. Yes. We're agnostic to the uh, hypervisor. They can be running Hyper-V. They can be running Zen. They can be running KVM. Yep. Any of them, Brian. Okay, great. Now, if you take me to the next slide, um, this technology has been in the marketplace for the last three years. So we've garnered not only a lot of customers, but we now have 15 different published case studies on our website uh, with uh, customers sharing what they've seen with our velocity. So if you want to know what some of these payouts look like for our customers, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. This just gives you the high little takeaways. I might highlight three of these. Uh, for instance, on the top left, Chris's Health, they virtualized all their physical servers running their electronic medical record application, Meditech. They ran into performance issues. They were about to pull, a two mil pull the trigger on a $2 million storage purchase from NetApp. Uh, before they did it, they evaluated Velocity first, and they found out we were able to double their EMR performance. And so they canceled uh, the PO for NetApp, and, and they saved $2 million. Uh, Bell Mobility, another customer of ours, they had a custom app sitting on SQL. Uh, it was taking their users far too long when they tried to generate reports. 
They tried velocity. We reduced the I.O. to SAN by 61% and tripled the speed of their SQL queries. Uh, another one of these, Suncoke Energy, um, they also had a query problem related to their business intelligence app, Cognos, running on Oracle. They tried upgrading their network to um, uh, they upgraded their network to, to 10 gig. Uh, they upgraded their their storage to an all flash EMC array, but it still wasn't enough. In fact, after months of troubleshooting, they had this query that just could they couldn't cut it down any lower than 25 seconds. After they tried velocity overnight, we dropped it to 15 seconds, and they just couldn't believe it. Uh, we delivered a 53% reduction in IOTA SAN. So. Um, if you just take me to the next slide, GQ, I know that we're at the bottom of the hour, and in fact, I just had a, a question that, that came in, and, and I think that this was the, the perfect, you know, softball question, and said, hey, is there, is there any metric that can be used to show benefit? Is there a performance monitor, you know, metric? Well, <laughs> the question, the answer to that is this, is, is velocity can be evaluated. Now, and I should mention, keep your questions coming in. Uh, on the bottom right Q&A box because we will address all of those at, uh, just as soon as we close out here, move to Q&A. But the velocity can be evaluated, and that's usually where most customers start, so you can see exactly what kind of performance gains you're getting in your real-world environment before you make any kind of purchase commitment. So that's why it's an absolute no-risk proposition. You can't lose. Now, some of our customers will use their own performance monitoring tool to validate before and after benefits. But the product does come with its own embedded tool called the Benefit Analyzer. It monitors and reports on your workloads before Velocity is installed and then collects data after Velocity installs and puts together a really clean before-after comparison on all the key metrics uh, that you care about. In fact, puts it into a nice shareable report form that you can share with supervisors and stakeholders to validate. And GQ, just take me to our, our last slide here. Um, we just released a free tool called the Conducive I.O. Assessment Tool um, that can troubleshoot your environment and tell you which systems have the most issues. Now, we had a lot of internal debate here about productizing this and charging for it. But for the time being, we're going to make this uh, performance, this I.O. Assessment Tool free uh, to the public. And this is one of the, the first groups to hear about this. This tool shows you the servers and virtual service environment with the most I.O. issues that you can do one of two, two things. You can either try to solve it with a hardware approach or you can evaluate our software first uh, to see what we can do. Now, some of our customers, GQ, they already know exactly where their problem is. They know exactly which systems are giving them the most problems and they skip the I.O. assessment tool and they just go straight into software evaluation. But for those who would like to do some troubleshooting in their environment first from VM to storage and see all the different performance metrics and highlighted issues about any workload, which you mean the I.O. assessment tool is really the perfect place to start, isn't it? It is, and I'm very excited about this new tool, Brian. You know, it's a very robust tool, and that shows you the amount of I.O. fraction that is occurring and whether it's a problem or not, and is it hurting performance. You know, and it's very unique because it's the size of I.O. Blender Index because it cross-correlates performance metrics from all the VMs on the same host to see if there's any spikes that occur at the same time. And that indicates chatter neighbor issues because of the I.O. Blender. And, GQ, there's not another troubleshooting tool we know of in the marketplace that has an I.O. Blender Index. No, this is unique. That's the first time, yeah. Mm-hmm. An industry first, Brian. <laughs> the, the tech guy teaching the marketing guy a lesson here. <laughs> so I told you how big an issue it is. And you can see the amount of workload on each system, IOPS, throughput, response time, and other things like queue death, CPU and memory utilization. So this tool shows the averages and the peaks for every hour, so you can really dig into it. And you know what? I, I really want to point this out. This is a very simple tool and completely non-intrusive. It's just gathering the existing Windows performance data that's already there, and it's going to give it back to you in an easy-to-read format along with our troubleshooting analysis. It's going to color code the system red, yellow, or green, and, it's going to, and that indicates a level of I.O. and the inefficiencies. Then it points out 
which of the 11 high-O performance metrics might be a concern, whether that's latency spikes, acute death issues, I.O. fracturing, or something else. Now, I should note that this tool is only meant to point out performance issues. It's possible and even likely that some systems in green actually do have I.O. issues under the surface. But you may be so over provisioned for performance that you're not seeing any performance issues on those systems. Right. right now. So GQ is basically this tool is just showing them where the performance issues are, where they're running into I.O. ceilings. Uh, you know, even if there are I.O. issues looming over the other the, under the surface, you know, some of these I.O. you know inefficiencies we talked about may not necessarily come up red just because they're over provisioned for performance on that system. Exactly. But they will still see the raw data to show them they have a problem under the surface, That's right? right. In fact, we should mention that, that other systems might even come up green simply because the workload is so light, it's not taxing your storage or harming the other systems on the same host. So not only does this tool show you averages and peaks by the hour to help you dig in, it also gives you a, a bit of analysis, then GQ, to show them which servers they should be concerned about and what of 11 different I.O. performance metrics they need to dig into on those systems. Exactly. You know, as I said, this is just using the Windows performance data, but trying to decipher what that data means to you, we've done that for you here. So um, we encourage users to run the tool for as long as you want to collect data. You know, most schedule it to run for five days, from Monday through Friday, and then um, share the data with one of our SCs so you can just kind of step through it and determine if and where velocity should be uh, evaluated. But really, that's it. Um, you know, that's the end of our uh, presentation portion of our webinar. Um, as there are a lot of different resources, case studies, white papers, infographic, it's all available on our website, uh, www.conducive.com. I've gotten a number of questions asking, can we get this presentation? Can we get this recording? Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. Right after the webinar is over, you will get an email within a couple hours from your account manager, from your Conducive account manager and they will supply a copy of this presentation um, so that you can share it with uh, stakeholders on your team. And, and now we'll also give you the on-demand webinar. It takes a little longer for it to be rendered by WebEx. So as soon as it's rendered, we'll email, we'll have the account manager email that to you. You might receive that tomorrow morning. And if you're interested in starting with this you know, free uh, I.O. assessment tool, um, it brings a lot of value to you even if you don't end up evaluating velocity at all because it shows you all the performance metrics you're going to care about from VM to storage um, and, and help you troubleshoot your own environment, GQ, they can just get that from one of our own salespeople or SCs, isn't that correct? Exactly. When you get the email from us, just respond back that you're interested in us. Okay, super. Well, I know that some of you uh, have held on. We tried to close at the bottom of the hour, but we ran over just a little long. And if you have to run, we understand that we hope to continue the conversation with you uh, over email and, um, and set up a time to speak with one of our solution specialists. But GQ, we said we'd go to a Q&A session and we would cover uh, questions here for as long as people have questions. So um, we just encourage the audience just to stay on uh, for as long as they want while we're taking questions and uh, get that in on the right-hand side, the bottom right-hand side Q&A box, address it to all panelists, and, and we'll start going through some of that. Okay. So I have a, a backlog of some questions to get to, GQ. Sure. Um, and uh, let me start first with Larry. He asks, is this going to work in an SSD-based environment? Yes. In fact, is, you know, some people think, oh, I'm running S SSDs. I don't need this. But, you know, it's a good analogy is that you, you've done – uh, get performance down at the storage level, what about doing the same thing where the I.O. begins? So now you have performance at the front and the beginning. And SSDs, they may not, uh, they may give great benefits with reads, but one issue that they have a little trouble with is writes. And that's because of the nature of how flash processes writes. It's a two-cycle uh, process. And by giving nice sequential writes, it actually makes them more efficient, Brian. So yes, we do help with SSDs. So I think the important point about uh, you know, for our for our customers or for any, not just our customers but anybody looking into the technology itself is that you know, uh, in an enterprise environment, you know, Windows is abstracted from the physical layer. 
So where the problem actually occurs is at the logical disk software layer that exists outside you know, the network storage device. The network storage device has no control over that. So if there's an IOPS inflation that's occurring due to inefficiencies of how Windows writes the logical disk layer, that creates an I.O. overhead issue to the underlying storage media, whether it's flash or spindles. That's right. Uh, so, you know, what if, what if we can reduce the I.O. going down that storage by half or even more? Right. That benefits flash just as equally as it's going to benefit um, disk, and most particularly it's going to benefit flash in the area of writes because, as we know, uh, flash really chokes on, on random writes. Absolutely, Brian. And you know what? Before you get to the next one, I, there is one question here from Riley that is kind of uh, related to this. Does, does the app think the data is written before it's actually written? Uh, and you know, Riley, just uh, address that question. A lot of people think we're buffering the writes to make it contiguous. And no, we're, we're doing something much simpler than that. We're actually just providing intelligence back to the file system so it can do a better job. So by it doing a better job, it's actually doing the writes itself in a nice sequential manner rather than randomizing that I.O. So uh, Thomas has a question here. Does the assessment tool provide projected savings if velocity is, is implemented? Uh, not this first version here. It will indicate which of the, you know, which systems are uh, having performance issues in certain areas and where we can uh, potentially help in those areas. But we don't indicate the exact percentage at this point. Now, what we can indicate is exactly how, uh, to give them an idea how big their, their problems are. Exactly, because we'll show it in, in a very simple manner, red, yellow, green. And red will really help out on them. And I think what he would care about the most is knowing this, is that once he does identify servers that do have, uh, that, that are experiencing an I.O. ceiling, and he can evaluate velocity for free to see exactly how much velocity is able to improve his environment. Exactly. And, you know, Brian, you said this before, some users already know which servers are suffering. So they can go straight to the evaluation phase without this, but if they don't, this is a great tool. Now, uh, Brian asks, where can I download the I.O. assessment tool? Uh, as I indicated before, uh, you're going to get an email following this uh, by your reps, and you can contact your rep to get this free utility. Okay. Yep. And Rodney asks the same question. Uh, how do we get the tool? What's the URL to the, to the I.O. assessment tool? Now, again, we'll, we'll just state this is a free tool. Um, and um, for, for the time being, <laughs> until, <laughs> until we productize this internally, but, but right now we're uh, road testing with the public and making it available for free. And, and the reason that we're doing this is because we're finding out that what's happening is it's profitable for us to give it away for free because GQ usually lends itself to someone recognizing the I.O. inefficiencies that they have and wanting to evaluate velocity in the first place. Exactly. A lot of people notice they have performance issue, but they don't know why. And Majority of the reasons is because it's I.O. related, and this will tell you why. Okay, now Roger has a good question here, and, and maybe let's see if we can stop, <laughs> stop the software engineer here. But he said, Roger said on slide four and five, you're showing percentages of on, on how many, now he said on how many test systems experienced uh, increases in throughput. And by the way, those weren't test systems. Those, those were all production environment evaluations of velocity goes, why didn't all of the systems experience the same amount of increase in, in throughput? You know what, and that's a good question, and because every system is different on its workload. Some of these systems that they tested on had very little or very light workload, and so they didn't even show any benefits, but others did have heavy workload, and that's where you got to see uh, a big benefit from our product. Because, hey, on systems that you're not doing anything, it doesn't matter. But the ones that you are expecting to perform for you and produce for you, those are the ones right. you want to get performance from. So, you know, it's mentioned that we said it, the typical experience for our customers finding out that 
that 50% of their I/O bandwidth is is being stolen from VM to storage. But it's a, it's an it's a variant. You know, in some cases, you know, it might only be 30%. In other cases, it might be as high as 80%. And it really has to do with two things: is that number one. Over time, the erosion that, of the relationship between I/O and data at the logical disk layer is worse on some Windows VMs than it is others Windows VMs. Isn't that right, GQ? That is true. Uh, depends, you know, it depends upon the type of workload, the type of process. You know, and, and we mentioned an instance where someone is dealing with maybe a 32K file that should be written and read as one I/O, and it gets broken down to four chunks or eight chunks. But GQ, you've seen some instances. And I know our audience may not believe this. But you've seen some instances where a single file has been broken apart not into just thousands of pieces at, at the uh, logical disk layer. And Brian, you, you know what, you're right. Just in the year, about a year and a half, two years ago, we got a report of a file that was in millions of pieces. In fact, it was so fragmented that no more data could be added to it. And, and we also got a case where it was a directed file, so no more files could be added to it. And they had to call us in to uh, get that solved, and our products do solve that. And what's strange is that since that year and a half ago, we've got increasingly more and more cases of that being reported. So, you know, and, and when you say fragmented, you're talking about that fragmentation that occurs again at the logical disk software layer that creates the I.O. overhead issue. So no matter what that, that SAN system might be doing on the controller level to try to mitigate problems of physical layer fragmentation, the fact is this, if Windows tells you a file exists at a million different you know, addresses at the logical disk layer, that means a million I.O. that the SAN has to produce That's to right. for that one file. Exactly. Right. That's unbelievable, Brian. <laughs> now, the other issue, too, that, that exacerbates this issue is not just what Windows is doing, but it also has to do with the number of other heavy workloads running on the same host. So if you only have one heavy workload running on, on a host, um, and the other VMs are really light workloads, you're not going to have as much randomization, as much chatty neighbor issues, but you begin to add more VMs, and all of those are, are running equivalent workloads, you know, especially during peak operation, you're going to get a lot more noise, even more tax, and, and further your reduction of what the available I.O. bandwidth is. So to answer your, your question, um, Roger, is, is it's really kind of a – you may be a more complicated technical discussion that we wanted you to get into perhaps, but it's to understand that every system is taxed with I.O., whether from the I.O. blender effect or the, or the Windows I.O. tax. It's a matter of how much it's taxed. And that I.O. assessment tool is really handy because it kind of acts really almost as a, uh, uh, something that can sweep through your environment to show you exactly where those issues are and how much those issues and how big they are. Exactly, Brian. So uh, I continue to get more you know, questions here on the I.O. assessment tool. You know, Alan says, uh, you know, how do we get it again? Lee says, you know, can the tool predict what improvements will be? Um, how do we get the free tool? I know that we answered it, but we continue to get questions in on it. Maybe just answer it one more time. Uh, you know what? After, after the presentation here, you're going to get a follow-up email from your uh, rep here. And just respond back to your rep, and that rep will get you this free utility. And Bill said, this is software that runs on each guest VM? No. What it is is you can run it on any one system, and you select what systems you want to monitor. And all this does is it's Well, I think that if – I'm not sure if Bill is asking about the I.O. assessment tool or, or Velocity itself. Oh, Velocity. I'm sorry. Uh, Velocity itself, you're right it gets installed on each of the client or guest VMs itself. And, uh, but we have what is called the Velocity Management Console. And you have a centralized console where you can deploy, manage, configure, and get reports from all your deployments from one central place. Okay, so th then how about the, the I.O. assessment tool? You mentioned it's a very lightweight monitoring tool um, that just uses the Windows data that's already being you know, accumulated. We just aggregate it and analyze it. So um, where, where does it install and how do they deploy it? You know what? It's a very simple, just executable. You don't even have to install it. You just unzip it, have run the utility, input the systems that you want to monitor, 
and it's just going to use uh, WMI to just gather the performance data from each of the systems. And after it gathers it for your selected time period, it will then generate a report back to you. Okay, now Alonzo said, hey, he has to log off. He said, can someone please send me the IO assessment <laughs> <laughs> and address? So, uh, I hope our, our, our administrators here helping us uh, on the WebEx are, are, are picking that up. We'll actually get that to you. Uh, and we've had a lot of great comments come from people thanking us for the webinar and the lunch and, and the uh, information. Um, we really do, uh, really do appreciate that. Uh, we do have a, a uh, some more questions here, GQ, that we want to get to, and we'll try to get to them as quickly as we can um, because it's hard for people to hang on longer than an hour. But, yeah. I mean, we'll stay as long as people ask questions. Um, uh, was it Stanton asked, is this only for Windows VMs? Right now it is only for VMs running Windows uh, platform here. Now, of course, we don't care what hypervisor is running as uh, as long as the Windows is running on the virtual machine, we'll run on that. So GQ, Mike says, so I'm not totally clear with the cache. Um, he says, uh, let me see if I can read this. Are the right cache in memory so the Windows think it's writing the disk? Oh, he, he's thinking that we're doing some right coalescing. Exactly, and we're not doing that, uh, Mike. Uh, our caching is a read-only cache, so there's no... Data integrity is our top concern, and it's always there with recache because that read, that data is already on disk already. On the write, we're not buffering that write to make it sequential. All we're doing is we're providing intelligence to the file system about how data is being processed on that system. So that file system now does a better job of creating nice sequential I.O rather than uh, random right, right I.O. And it, it's, actually, it's, it's actually a very simple solution. Um, you know, the operating system is only looking for the next available allocation uh, yeah. because the, the Windows operating system, the operating system itself is not aware of file sizes, GQ, so it can't pick the best allocation. What we do is feed file size intelligence to Windows and help it choose the best allocation so it makes much more contiguous writes and resolves the issue of IOPS inflation of how the relationship between I.O. and data breaks down over time from free space fragmentation at the logical layer. Exactly. Uh, Windows system tries to do a one-size-fits-all because it doesn't know how files are created or extended. By providing that data to it, it can now do a better job. Uh, question here, GQ. How can Velocity optimize across multiple guest OSs when they don't directly communicate with each other? Well, we're, we're optimizing on each of the individual VMs. Now, by doing that, we're optimizing the I.O. that comes from each of the VMs, and all that I.O. is going to come down and cause this I.O. blender effect. And by decreasing that and optimizing that, we're uh, solving that uh, performance issue. Okay. Uh, Mike asks, should people run defrags on, on Windows VM guests? Uh, what we do here is only defragment if it causes a performance issue. If it's not causing a performance issue, then you don't need to. And, of course, with our IntelliWrite, we don't eliminate, we're not uh, have to go eliminate fragmentation. We're preventing it from occurring in the first place. Right. So that way there, there's even no issue of fragmentation occurring on the physical layer because we're solving that problem proactively by helping Windows write files to logical layer in a more contiguous fashion. Exactly. Okay. And I think everybody here knows what a pain it would be to even try to defrag you know, their environment, which involves migrating a volume, taking a volume offline, defragging it, bring it, bring it back. I mean, with velocity, that's not even occurring. Exactly. And, you know, the nice thing about this IntelliWrite, by preventing the fragmentation, it's completely compatible with all the advanced storage uh, okay. uh, devices and that are occurring at the storage level. Now, GQ, I mean, we have three, five minutes here before the top of the hour. We still have 156 uh, you know, organizations that, are, that have held on with us, and, and we have a couple of really good questions to get to here. Okay. Um, I, I know everyone would like to hear 
Well, this one is, this is a two-fold question from two different people. And again, it's, it's on the IO assessment tool that we're giving away for free, or at least for right now. <laughs> is, uh, do I have to install the assessment tool on each server? Uh, it's, again, it's a, it's a question of am I installing it? And then another, does this assessment tool, does it run from vCenter or just you know, from any Windows VM in the infrastructure? Um, I think, again, that they're thinking that they need to deploy it and install it, and you're saying it's just an executable That's that right. they just have to open and run and point to the systems you want monitored. That's it. And it, it, it just runs on any old Windows VM inside the infra infrastructure. And you just run it, give it the system that you want to monitor, and it will produce the data. Okay. Uh, now, I do have a couple questions here related to cloud uh, infrastructure. In fact, you know, Ed mentions, you know, hey, really appreciates the presentation. It's good timing. Um, they're wrapping up a cloud, infra, uh, a Windows cloud infrastructure project that needs excellent I.O. And then at the same time, um, I got a question from uh, who wasn't here. It was David who said, you know, can Velocity be deployed to VMs that we have running in the cloud because they're needing some, some I.O. help? Yes, you know, if you have that infrastructure or platform as a service out there, you can certainly deploy our product out there and get the benefits out there on that virtual machine. Okay. Well, now I'm going to continue to play, you know, stump, you know, the, uh, the architect here. You know, is your read caching smart enough to know when the underlying data gets dirty uh, from subsequent writes? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, I said we're a read-only cache, but, of course, if that data gets written to, that automatically flushes it out of our cache. It invalidates it. So, yes. So, um, some questions here on pricing. Uh, I've, I've had four or five chime in, hey, how much is it? And, um, you know, are there, like, nonprofit pricing discounts? Yes, there are nonprofit pricing discounts. Um, we do price it very attractively by host. Um, we don't just give uh, a pricing uh, a la carte, you know, uh, over a, a public webinar, but you will receive an email from your account manager, and we encourage you just to take up the uh, the conversation on pricing with your account manager. Um, get an idea for the size of your environment, because of course you know there's there's volume discounts according to the size of the environment. I think that everyone will be surprised uh, how attractive it is. You're considering the level of performance it provides. In fact, the nicest thing really of all about the product GQ is that the software can be evaluated itself. It shows before and after comparison of results. So no one is going into this purchase process blindly. They see the exact ROI before there's any purchase commitment. Exactly. You know, people ask, how, do, how would this benefit me? Well, you can see yourself. Now, I, I have someone here, want, Harvey wants to ask you a question on your product roadmap, Gary. And he said, hey, any plans to make this assessment tool available for Linux VMs? That is, we're looking at that. So. Uh, that that's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is uh, Lee asked? You know, and I know we we you answered this. I, I feel like in a couple different ways. But um, oh, actually, before we like get before I wear the audience of that one, let me ask. Uh, Tammy just says here, GQ, do we help with Exchange? <laughs> yes. You know, we we mentioned databases, but another area that we've seen great performance on is on Exchange servers, too. So that, that's one of our sweet spots, too, Brian. Okay. Uh, a question here from David. I don't know who my account manager is. I, I can do some of it. And as, as mentioned, you will be getting an email from your account manager with a link to this presentation shortly after the webinar is over. Um, you will also receive an email tomorrow, should receive an email tomorrow with a link to the on-demand webinar. Uh, from your account manager, and you can engage them. If for some reason uh, something falls through the cracks, you don't hear from somebody, of course, you can just always go to our website, and, um, and, and you can contact us. You can go straight to the Velocity page and, and request a Velocity evaluation. That would uh, get you immediately in touch with somebody if you want to talk to somebody um, immediately. Now, uh, James has a question here at GQ, and I think that this is the last question that I have, unless you saw any that I missed. And unless any more come in, just before we close, uh, we still have 135 you know, organizations with us. <laughs> James asks, can Velocity help me with my physical servers? He's not 100% virtualized. 
He does have some physical servers. In fact, we find out with a lot of companies, GQ, some of them are still running their heaviest workloads on physical servers uh, simply because you know, it's utilizing all the resources that they need so there's no reason for them to, to virtualize it. Um, maybe you can speak to that. Exactly, and we do have um, Velocity that will run on your physical servers, and you're going to see the same benefits that you see with the with the you know, virtualized machines. Now, with the virtualized machines, you'll see more of a blender effect than you will see on the physical machines. So, uh, but even on the physical machines, you do get a blender effect because if you have a whole bunch of physical machines accessing the same SAN, well, we're going to help out on that blender. And one thing we found too on the on the physical systems, as much as you know, there might not be the same pronounced you know, I/O blender effect like the the virtualized uh, environment. Um, you still get, you still have a Windows in inefficiency that's creating increasingly smaller, more fractured I/O. It might not be getting as badly randomized, but one thing we do find out, GQ, is that in a virtual environment, uh, they might not be as well provisioned for available you know, DRAM per VM because they're all sharing the resources on the same host. But on the physical server side, they have a tendency to carve out a little bit more cash for velocity and see really demonstrable gains from that, especially from the read I/O. Exactly. And you know, one thing nice about Velocity, especially on this physical system, it detects whether that storage is directly attached or remotely attached. And it's going to use different optimization methods that will benefit the most for those. All right, GQ, let me just take one last uh, look here and make sure that uh, I, I think that we answered every question uh, that came in, unless I missed anything else. And for some reason I did. Um, you can just have that conversation with your account manager after this webinar. They'll be more than happy uh, to answer your question. And if it's more technical than they can answer, uh, there's an SC in your territory that you, they can get you connected directly with. So, GQ, uh, any parting words? No, nah, you know what? Uh, as always, had fun uh, doing this with you, Brian, and uh, pr presenting this to the rest of our uh, uh, guests here. Sure. And just. Um, creating a lot of awareness about some of these I/O inefficiencies that happen in virtual environments under the hood that n no administrator really has any idea what's actually happening because their hardware can't optimize um, an I/O profile that's not friendly for their underlying storage device. So, with that said, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed lunch. Uh, you'll be contacted shortly from your account manager, and as mentioned. Uh, a nice place to start is with that I.O. assessment tool, uh, just a free tool that you can start. And um, whether or not you end up evaluating the software, that should help you uh, with some benefit to troubleshooting your own environment. So uh, we thank you for your time today, and we look forward to speaking again shortly. Everyone have a nice day. Thank you, Brian.